people getting involved in homeschooling, and I'm sure that most of them realize that there's something terribly wrong with American public education. And that's the reason why they're, they're deciding to take matters into their own hands. And you could say that uh, if, if you want to know why you should take your child out of the public school, it's very simple. Your child is at risk in the public schools. They are at risk in four very serious ways. They're at risk academically, spiritually, morally, and even physically. Now, the academic risk we've known about for many years. At least one-third of the children who go through public education emerge at the end of the process as functional illiterates. One-third. Another third emerge as moderately literate. And you might say that maybe just one-third of the entire uh, body of students who go through that process emerge with a, pro, uh, a proficient literacy. It's very hard to become truly literate in the public schools because th that is not their aim. Academically, their aim is you might say, to create a kind of conformist individual uh, who will simply uh, do the bidding of the education elite. The functional illiterates, of course, are going to be the cannon fodder or just the, you know, the, they're going to be flipping hamburgers for the rest of their lives. Many of them make up the, uh, the so-called underclass in American cities. I mean, why do we have an underclass in America? Why do so many people who have spent 12, 10, 12 years in American schools come out with no employable skills? How can you spend 12 years in school and come out knowing nothing? It's not easy, you know. <laughs> it's not easy producing functional illiterates. You need special reading programs. <laughs> you need specially trained teachers. You need special books. It's very expensive, too. All of those programs are very costly. It's very cheap to teach a child to read, very inexpensive and very easy. And I can prove this very simply by, by uh, I didn't bring it with me, but I have at home a blue-backed speller, one of the books that was used to teach children to read back in the 1840s, 1830s and 40s. If you've ever seen the little books that were used in the early part of this country to teach a child to read, you could put the book in your pocket. And that child taught the child, that, that book taught everyone in America to read very simply through intensive phonics, which is the proper way to teach children to read an alphabetic writing system. But in the early part of uh, the 1930s, our professors of education threw uh, the phonics system out of the public schools they decided to teach children to read English as if it were Chinese, an ideographic writing system. Now, uh, and Rudolf Flesch in 1955 wrote a famous book entitled Why Johnny Can't Read. And in that book he said that when you impose an ideographic teaching technique on an alphabetic writing system, you get reading disability. So he told the ed educators exactly what was wrong and of course, they denounced Rudolf Flesch. Uh, they refused to accept his, uh, uh, his findings, the research, and they continued to teach children to read English as if it were Chinese. So they know uh, what works. I even have even better proof of that they know what works. You know, uh, back in the early part of this century, after the Russian Revolution, John Dewey, who was the father of progressive education, he and his colleagues convinced uh, Lenin's wife, Krupskaya, to adopt the progressive education program for the schools of Russia. And so they adopted progressive education in Russia right after the revolution. It produced such terrible results, such illiteracy, that the Communist Party in 1933 made a complete about-face, threw out progressive education, and returned to a traditional form of teaching, to a phonetic form of teaching Russian. 
so that in Russia today, anyone who goes to school learns how to read. They don't have dyslexics, they don't have functional illiterates. Everybody learns to read in the Soviet Union because they teach children to read Russian with a phonetic method. So our educators in 1932 knew that progressive education did not work. They knew it in 1932, they wrote about it, they deplored the fact that the Russians weren't going to use it, they knew what the complaints were, and yet they put it in American schools. They knew it was a failure, and yet they put it in American schools. Well, are you going to tell me that these top educators are not bright enough to know that this method doesn't work or what it does? They knew it produced illiteracy, functional illiteracy. And yet they put it in our schools, and now we have this incredible reading problem in America. I mean, we have this illiteracy problem. You've seen things on television, you know, you've seen documentaries on television, Barbara Bush is involved, everybody now is involved in, you know, adult illiteracy. Uh, you go back to the figures, for example, back in 1930, the illiteracy rate among urban blacks was 9.2% in 1930. In 1990, it's probably about 50%. So what, have the blacks uh, lost the ability to learn to read since 1930? No, it's just that this method of teaching produces the symptoms of dyslexia, produces functional illiteracy. Now, here we have this horrendous reading problem in America, and, you would, and everybody's clamoring for excellence, for reading, uh, you know, uh, proficiency. And what do the educators come up with? They come up with something called whole language. Do you know what whole language is? It's the same look, same method, but taken to a more primitive stage. That's all it is. As a matter of fact, that's what the Russians were using, whole language. It was a failure then, and it is going to fail now. So whole language is now sweeping the United States. Do you expect the literacy problem to improve in this country in the next 10, 20 years? They are presently crippling children who will have to man the industries 20 and 30 years from now. What do you think America is going to be like? Now, if you go to the school, and, and I'll tell you, today's public school teachers think that, uh, that uh, whole language is the greatest thing since sliced bread. You can't convince them otherwise. To them, it's become a religion. They're fanatics about it. I've been a member of the Reading Reform Foundation since 1962. That organization was founded by Watson Washburn in order to get phonics back in the schools. In 1962, the organization was founded. Here we are in 1990, and we're no closer to getting phonics back in the schools than we were then. As a matter of fact, the situation is worse now. If you want to teach intensive phonics in a public school, you've got to keep very quiet about it. As a matter of fact, intensive phonics has now gone underground in America in public education. So from an academic point of view, the children are at more risk today than ever. Of course, now they have what is known as invented spelling. Have you heard of invented spelling? Where the kids are encouraged to write any way they want, spell the word any way they want. Let me give you a story about invented spelling. Uh, I was told this by a mother. A little boy uh, wanted to make a sign for his little sister. She was, she was uh, I think, three years old, but she, was, she has a talent for drawing, so he wanted to make a sign that said, Artist at Work, for his sister. So at school, he was in, I think, first or second grade, I forget which, which grade he was in, he wrote the sign, Artist at Work, and he spelled work W-E-R-C-K. And he took it to the teacher, and, and uh, he said, what do you think of my sign? She said, that's wonderful. And then, he, uh, and then she asked him, what does W-E-R-C-K say? And he said, work. The sign says, Artist at Work. She said, that's terrific. So he took the sign home, and he showed it to his older sister. And she said, that's not how you spell work. You don't spell work, W-E-R-C-K. And he said, well, my teacher said that that's the way to spell it, you know. 
So she said, well, here's the dictionary. This is how you spell work, W-O-R-K. Well, when he found out that his teacher had misled him, he was very angry. He was very upset to have been told that that was correct. You know, children want to do things the right way. You, you go to school to be told how to do things the right way. The, the, children don't have traumas because they're told that this is the way to do it. You know, you don't have to hit them over the head to tell them how to spell a word correctly. But that child was misled. He was embarrassed, humiliated by that whole trauma. And of course, what do you think he thinks of his teacher? He can't trust her. You can't trust a teacher who won't tell you which is the right way to do things. I mean, for example, supposing you were taking golfing lessons and you hired a professional golfer to teach you and you got on the course there and you were teeing up and you asked, well, how do I hold the club? And he said, any way you want. Well, what would you say to that professional? You say, well, I don't need you to tell me to do that. I can do that on my own. I don't need you for that, you see. So now they have invented spelling and whole language is invented reading because they are encouraging children to read any way they want, that the author's exact words are not important. As a matter of fact, here's an article that was in the um, Washington Post about whole language. Let me see if I can get the front, the first page of that. And the and the headline was, uh, "Children learn uh, children learn to read by guessing." <laughs> by guessing. Oh, here it is. Reading method lets pupils guess. Whole language approach riles advocates of phonics. Uh, the most controversial aspect of whole language is the de-emphasis on accuracy. <laughs> That's what the article says. American Reading Council President Julia Palmer, an advocate of the, the approach, said it is acceptable if a young child reads the word house for home or substitutes the word pony for horse. It's not very serious because she understands the meaning, said Palmer. Accuracy is not the name of the game. That's what this reading expert says. She's the head of the American Reading Council, American Reading Council, she's the president. And she says that accuracy is not the name of the game. Oh, it's accuracy is the name of the game for the Japanese and the Germans, but not for us, you see. You know why it's not the name of the game for Americans? Because we are being dumbed down. The whole American population is being dumbed down because they want to control us so that we won't know up from down, we won't know the Constitution from the Declaration. Because they have their own agenda. And all you have to do is read what the, uh, what the educators write. You know, that's the only way you can find out what is going on in American education is to read what the educators write. And where do they write their articles? You won't find them in the National Enquirer or in Life magazine. They write in journals of education. Have you ever seen a journal of education? Forget it. They're boring. Horrible. Do you know where you find? They're not sold on the newsstands. They're not even in your public library. If you want to get a journal of education, you've got to go to a university library. And then you've got to go in the stacks and you've got to hunt for these things. And there you will find, you know, this, every graduate school of education publishes a journal of education. And that's where they discuss all of the problems of American education. And so if you want to find out what the educators are saying and planning, that's where you find out. And that's what I read. That's why I know what they're doing. They have no intention of producing educational excellence. This is the greatest scam or, 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 or con game that has ever been perpetrated on the American people. All they want from you are your children and your money. That's all they want from you, your children and your money, and that's all you're going to hear from them. 
So they're not going to teach them to read. They're not going to teach them to, to spell. And as far as arithmetic is concerned, they don't even use the word anymore. There's no such thing as arithmetic anymore. It's all math. When's the last time you heard the word arithmetic? It's all math. Now, everything is math. And they don't teach arithmetic for one simple reason. The only way you can learn arithmetic is by rote memory. You have to be drilled in it. It's a, you know why? Because it's a memory system. It's like expecting an actor to learn his lines without memorizing them. I mean, that's, that's the business. If you become an actor, you have to learn to memorize lines. If you want to learn to use arithmetic, you have to memorize the arithmetic facts. But you see, rote is a dirty word in American education. They don't teach rote learning. And that's why today's kids are totally dependent on the cash registers. The calculators, the cash registers, I mean, they can't add anything on their own. What happens when the electricity is out? <laughs> of course, they can't make change. They don't know how. So when it comes to academics, the schools are hopeless and, and they're going to cripple your child academically. Putting them in a, in a public school is, is really condemning your child to being crippled from an intellectual point of view because if they can't read they're not going to be able to use their minds they're not going to be able to fend for themselves in this society to any great degree we have an underclass to prove it everybody in the underclass went to school you have to go to school in America as you all know if you're homeschooling they let you know that you have to put children in school don't they you don't forget it so all of those people in the inner cities who are now on drugs, selling drugs, killing one another, they all went to public school. And what is the result? Total chaos, mayhem, social anarchy. So that's just the academic risk. That's the academic risk. The spiritual risk. The public schools these days are doing everything in their power to destroy Christianity, to destroy the religious beliefs, the spiritual health of your child. How do they do that? Through a variety of programs, through values clarification, situational ethics, uh, uh, multiculturalism, globalism, uh, transcendental meditation, out-of-body experience, Eastern religion, New Age uh, teaching techniques, sex education, evolution, death education. You've heard of death education? Oh, that's the big thing now in public schools. They've got to teach children all about death and dying. So they, they have kids write their own obituaries, write their own epitaphs, they take the kids to cemeteries, they take them to funeral parlors, uh, the kids uh, try out the coffins. <laughs> And, of course, they write uh, these, these uh, and the result is, uh, with all this death education, they plan their own funerals, they choose the music for their funerals, they make up a, a guest list for their own funerals. Can you imagine a 14-year-old planning his own funeral? This is going on now all over America. There, as a matter of fact, right here in Maine, last time I was up here, I was given a clipping from a newspaper in Windsor, Maine. A front page, not a, well, it was a big story with a picture showing these kids learning all about death and dying. And uh, it, it said everything. They were going to cemeteries. They were doing all these wonderful things. And isn't it, isn't it interesting that ever since the introduction of death education in American schools, we've had this incredible teenage suicide problem. You know, since... A death education was introduced in the schools in the early 1970s. The, uh, the suicide rate has been between 5,000 and 6,000 a year among teenagers. That means that by now, over 50,000 teenagers have committed suicide in America. Over 50,000. When I was growing up, it was unheard of. A young person committing, a teenager committing suicide before they've had any, you know, any problems in life. What's there to commit suicide over at that age? They haven't gotten married yet. They haven't gotten divorced. <laughs> I 
What's to commit suicide over? Especially today in the United States when the kids have everything. My God, they've got stereos, they've got automobiles, they've got, uh, you know, trips to Disney World. Big Macs. I mean, what, you know, they've got more. This generation of Americans has more than any generation in history, and yet they're killing themselves. To them, death is preferable to life. Why is that? I'll tell you why. Because they are teaching the kids to hate life and to love death. That's what they're teaching the kids. Now, how do they do that? They do that in a very simple way. In values clarification, they teach them to hate life. Now, how do they do that? Well, in values clarification, they give them the lifeboat survival game. Have you heard of that? Or the fallout shelter survival game in which the kids have to decide who is to live and who is to die. Who do I throw out of the lifeboat? My grandmother or my sister? The child is put in this position where he has to play God and decide who is to live and who is to die. Well, that, you know, to some kids, you know, that nothing phases them. They'll throw everyone out of the lifeboat, you know. <laughs> but there are some kids who are very sensitive who can't throw anyone out, let alone a, a, a relative or someone that, that is dear to them. And the shocking news that, uh, that, that when they grow up, they're going to have to make such decisions is quite traumatic. I mean, this is what the teachers tell them, that this is, these are the decisions you're going to have to make in later life. You're going to have to decide who is to live and who is to die. And the teachers are not kidding, because the teachers are humanists, and humanists believe that in the world of the future, the old folks will be put out of their misery, and you'll have to decide who is to live and who is to die on the basis of their social usefulness. So the kids are being groomed to make these decisions. They're already being indoctrinated in abortion. We know that. I mean, when you have these so-called uh, choice rallies, they always have the kids. You notice they have little kids now carrying signs for choice. And uh, so they're grooming Americans to, uh, to uh, live in a world, a pagan humanist world, in which life can be uh, decided on by, uh, you know, who knows how they're going to decide. But I suppose on social usefulness, that's what they tell the kids. If you go, if you go through one of these uh, lifeboat survival games or fallout shelter survival game projects where they give you the list of people and they designate something about each one. And so you pick out, well, this one is a sick child. Eliminate him. This one's a clergyman. Eliminate him. <laughs> Usually they go first. They're useless people, you know. Uh, and usually when you, when you see how it works out, it's very cleverly done. These exercises are very clever and, and quite evil. But that's what they're doing. And the kids, some of the kids come to the conclusion that if this is what life is about, I want no part of it. If human sacrifice is part of, of, uh, of life in America. I don't care for it one bit. You know, in every pagan religion, there is human sacrifice. I just picked up a book the other day in the bookstore on human sacrifice. The Aztecs had an incredible sacrificial ceremonies. You know, they use those pyramids. I mean, they, those pyramids were just covered with blood cutting out hearts, chopping off heads, I mean, the things they did to human beings. And this has been done in all primitive religions. The, the Druids did the same thing. They would create these kind of wicker structures and fill them with people and burn them, set them afire. The Druids are the ones who invented Halloween. And that's what your kids in public school are told to, you know, are encouraged to celebrate, all about Halloween and the witches and all of that. And when you go back and when you go into the, 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 uh, the Druid religion, you find out that human sacrifice was a very important part of that. And here in the United States, we hear about children disappearing. Nobody knows what's happened to these children. We hear that there are secret satanic groups that are into human sacrifice. I mean, this is, this is what the public schools are leading the kids into. To give you an idea, uh, how, how evil some of this stuff is. I was sent this by fax from Detroit. This was in yes, uh, yesterday's Detroit newspaper. 
or the day before. Scary books will stay. That's the headline. Livonia parents angry at school board decision. When Pam Wire's first grade daughter began having nightmares and asking if she would have to eat worms in her coffin when she died, the Livonia mother began to worry. Wire then learned from other parents that her daughter's teacher at Garfield Elementary had been reading the class two books, Scary Poems for Rotten Kids and Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. The books tell rhyming stories of rotting worm-riddled bodies lurking in walls and of coffins leaking with decomposing bodies. Illustrations portray decapitated heads and grinning skulls. Images like these became the focus of several children's nightmares, Wire said. But despite parents' protests, a special committee assembled by the Livonia Board of Education in May denied their request to bar the book outright in kindergarten through third grade. Monday, about a dozen parents took their case before the board, then reacted with anger at the four to one vote to retain the books. That tells you where the educators are. They don't care. You're going to, kids going to have nightmare? Tough. So they teach the kids to hate life. Now, how do they teach them to love death? Well, in death education, they tell them how nice and friendly death is. That death is part of life, you know, and it's another stage in life. And, and uh, it's not at all something to be afraid of. Now, the point is, sure, one should not fear death, but one should hate death. One should not love death. But these kids are being seduced into believing that death is something very nice, that, you know, there probably is an afterlife. The way these kids plan their own funerals, you can see they put a lot of work into it, a lot of thought into it. And so when the kids have the, and incidentally, the kids who are commi committing suicide are perfectly normal apple pie kids. They are the ones who seem to be more affected by this stuff than neurotic kids, because neurotic kids are mixed up anyway. So, you know, they just, just get a little more mixed up. But the normal kids are very much affected by this. Why? How? Well, you see, a normal child has been told by his parents, a normal child obeys his parents. And he believes that when he is sent to school, his parents tell him to obey the teacher, listen to the teacher because the teacher is basically doing what I would be doing. So the child takes very seriously what the, uh, what the teacher tells him. And he assumes that the, the child assumes that this is what the parent wants that child to know. And so some very obedient children go off the deep edge. They can't take this. And they are the ones who are committing suicide. It's always, you know, Normal school, like in Omaha, where three committed suicide. We just had the case down in Sheridan, Arkansas. Nobody can understand why these, these very normal kids committed suicide, three of them in Sheridan, Arkansas in, Arkansas, in a 24-hour period. And if you ask the educators why are the commi kids committing suicide, they say, well, we just don't know. It may have something to do with their lack of self-esteem. You know, so they think that, well, now we've got to teach self-esteem because that affects suicide. But of course, we know that self-esteem has nothing to do with it. But the educators, what do they know? But you would think that by now, after 50,000 suicides, they'd be willing to say, hey, maybe this death education is having a negative effect on some of the kids. You would think that at least they'd begin to look into it. But they're not. They don't bother to look into this. They don't bother to investigate. There hasn't been a single research study done on uh, the possible connection between death education and suicide. So you, uh, so you put your child in a public school and uh, he very well, very well may get involved with Satanism. Of course, rock music now, that's it. Satanism, 
may commit suicide, get involved, in, of course, in some form of paganism, which is now sweeping the, 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 uh, the youth culture, aided and abetted by the music that's, that's played for them and the, the videos, you see. So the only way you can protect your children is to get them out of the schools and to educate them at home because that's where they're protected. That's where they've got... It's a safe haven in this world awash with perversion and corruption and lunacy. It's all lunacy. It's all a form of lunacy. So that's the danger to their spiritual lives. What they're teaching in the schools has, uh, may very well affect them, them permanently. Then, of course, there's the moral, the moral risk. You put your child in a public school and who does he or she come in contact with? The drug users, the drug pushers, the sexually active, the users of foul language. You want your child to start uh, swearing like a drunken sailor? Just put him in a public school. It's very interesting the reports I've had of, of, from parents who say when they put their child in the public school he was a happy, smiling youngster, wonderful, and in a year's time, he was rebellious, foul-tongued, total change in personality, total change in personality. So what are they teaching the kids on uh, when it comes to drugs? Well, for years they were teaching them, you know, make your own decisions, kids, decision-making. Uh, you know, and they would give the kids, uh, what they would do is, is give them virtually a pharmaceutical cor course, course on drugs. They would tell the kids all about this drug and that drug and how this one does this to you and that one gives you this kind of a high and this one does that and, and, the, and the children would be told, well now you make your decision whether to smoke marijuana or not or whether to shoot up with heroin. That's your decision to make. And so kids would look down the list and they'd say, well listen, I might try number one, peyote. Try number two, maybe three, etc. So they made their decisions. They figured that if the teacher told them to make their decisions, that any decision they'd make would be okay. Because nobody would tell you to make a decision if it, if it involved your life, would they? Would you tell somebody, uh, uh, if you're going to cross the street, you decide whether you want to cross in front of a bus or not. An oncoming speeding bus. You make your decision about it. You tell your child you don't. You say no. You may not. You say more than no. You say never. By no means. Under no circumstances. That's what you say. You don't say make your own decision. But the educators tell the kids, you make your own decision. Well, now, of course, they've come up with this slogan, just say no. Took them 20 years to think that one up. <laughs> Just say no. You see. But they're not quite ready to just say no to, to, uh, to uh, premarital sex. There it's still make your own decision, you know. Make your own decision about premarital sex. Why? Well, they, they're not going to say never under no circumstances to the children. It's very interesting how the educators use a double standard. When they talk about racial prejudice, for example, do they say, well, you have a choice whether to be prejudiced or not. Make up your mind. You can decide to like blacks or not like blacks. They tell you, no, it's a total, you know, in our society now, it's a complete total no. Under no circumstances can you possibly be racially prejudiced in America. So they know how to they know what an absolute is. See, they know what an absolute is. What when it's something they want, they will make an absolute about it. But if it has something to do with lifestyle, that's another thing. So what do they talk about in sex? Safe sex. And what are they promoting all over the country? the use of condoms, as if that's going to cure the problem, as if that's going to solve any problem. As we all know, condoms are, are no more reliable than, than uh, 
they're less reliable than automobile tires. I think there are fewer tire failures than there are, <laughs> than there are uh, condom failures. And here we have this deadly disease in America. We have more, we have more uh, venereal diseases, sexually transmitted diseases than we've ever had in history. And what do they offer the kids? Russian roulette. That's what they're offering them. Russian roulette. You take your chances because you must have sex. You must. Why? Well, you're an animal, you see. They've taught them in, in about evolution and how they're animals, and animals can't resist it. I mean, when the season comes, the animals do it. And of course, since we don't have any seasons, we do it all the time. <laughs> you see? So kiddos, we know that you can't possibly control yourselves, you see. We know you're a bunch of animals, so we advise you to use a condom. Now, of course, one of the reasons why they're advising this is because there's a whole abortion industry that depends on unwanted pregnancies. They don't want to shut off their business by telling kids no, that under no circumstances should you engage in premarital sex. They don't want to say, they don't want to tell anything like that to the kids, would they? I mean, that would close down the abortion business. They would put the condom business out of, uh, out of kilter. So you can see what that, the way they're training the children. And this, they are pushing this safe sex business, this condom business, to such extremes that now they have, uh, uh, you know, uh, condom days on campuses. They give out colored condoms. Uh, candy colored condoms to kids they demonstrate in classrooms how to put a condom on I mean it's it's reached the point it is so horrible so perverse so filthy that's what's happened to the public schools so do you want your child to be under that kind of influence that's the moral influence in the schools that's what's happening there when it comes to uh, sex and drugs and foul language. And then, of course, there's the physical risk. You know, kids go to school these days with guns, with knives, with chains. I mean, you know, they have, they have weapons checks, metal detectors in some schools in the large cities. And incidentally, it's not only in the large cities where kids are bringing guns to school, you find out, and sometimes in these nice country towns, there's, you have an awful violence. For example, I spoke in a town in the middle of Lewiston, in the middle of uh, Montana. Beautiful town, you know, in the prairies out there. Who would, you, who would think that you would have something terrible happen there? Well, what happened there was that a youngster uh, was given a failing grade by his teacher in French, he wanted to go uh, overseas as an exchange student, and this killed his chances, and so he was very upset. So he took his father's gun, and he went to school, and he knocked on the, the teacher's door, and the door opened, and he shot the teacher right in the face and killed her on the spot. The only problem is he shot the wrong teacher. He shot a substitute who was there for that day. Substitute a mother of three children was killed. She went to school, you know, to do her duty as a substitute, and she was killed by the student. And it turned out that he was a perfectly normal American kid. He had a paper route. Where these kids learn these things, you know, God only knows. But these kids are taught uh, that they, they don't teach any morality, no Ten Commandments, no thou shalt not kill. So you, get, you have a lot of these kids who have no morals. They are amoral. And they're, you know, they watch all kinds of things on television. And they have no control over their emotions or feelings. And so they do these horrible things. And we've had incidents like this all over the country, as you know. These shootings. You have these shootings now of, of, uh, str uh, of individuals coming into, uh, into schools with automatic weapons and mowing down a couple of people 
It's interesting, the case in Stockton, California, the young man who did that had been a student in that school. He had been in that school in the primary grades. He couldn't even, you know, spell correctly. In his, in his uh, letter, in his uh, suicide note, he spelled Satan, S-A-T-I-N. They had crippled him in that school, so he had no love for that school. You see, an awful lot of children come out hating the school that's destroyed them. Now, how do they know that the school has destroyed them? Well, every child teaches himself to speak his own language. Doesn't he do that? Before he goes to school, for five, six years, he's taught himself to speak his own language, and he feels very intelligent. That's quite a feat for a small child. He feels very intelligent. And the reason why he feels very intelligent is because he is intelligent. Then he enters school, and in six months, he's told he's stupid. And he begins to feel stupid because he can't learn to read by these methods. And he feels there's something wrong with him. He knows when he entered school, he felt intelligent. And six months to a year later, he feels stupid. He knows that something has happened to him. Something has been done to him in that school. And he, create, and he begins to hate the place because could you hate anything more than, 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 than an instrument that destroys your mind? Now, there are a lot of intelligent kids who realize that something is happening to them, and nobody likes to sit still while their brains are being destroyed. I mean, you see, what, what these methods, these teaching methods, it's as if the teachers were performing a non-surgical prefrontal lobotomy. Nobody would sit still for that. So they become hyperactive. They act up. You're not going to sit in your seat while somebody's trying to destroy your mind. So they have a way of dealing with such kids. You know what they do with them? They drug them. They give them Ritalin. And that changes them into blobs, zombies, in the classroom. So you see how clever the educators are? They know that they're using methods of teaching that cripple the children, that destroy the minds, and they know that that's going to produce behavioral problems, so they have a drug waiting there ready to take care of that problem, to make sure that the kid will sit in that seat in the school. It shows you how insidious all of this is. And now we have special education. And the largest single group of children in special education, who do you think they are? They're not the deaf and the dumb and the blind. They are the learning disabled. They are all of these kids who were very learning able up to the age of six, who taught themselves to speak their own language, so they were very learning able, and once they got into school, they became learning disabled. And now they have to have these special classes for them called special ed, and that requires specialized teaching and teachers with degrees, and now they have the universities that's churning out or turning out these special ed certified teachers by the thousands to take care of the cripples that are being created in the first grade. So now all of these, all the, these professionals have a vested interest in making sure that they have more cripples. They're not going to replace whole language with intensive phonics because that would put special ed out of business. So they're not going to do that, you see. But you can see how all of this ties up with violence as well because these kids when you do this to children, when you destroy their minds, you tamper with their feelings, when you molest them emotionally as they do in uh, death ed, when you molest them that way, they will hate the school and they will hate their teachers and they will do some pretty awful things. And that's why we have more and more criminals. Uh, it's not getting any better. It's getting worse because there is tremendous emphasis now put on what they call the affective domain. You see, today's public education curriculum is divided into two parts. It's divided into the cognitive domain and the affective domain. Now, in the cognitive domain, that's supposed to uh, refer to reading, writing, and arithmetic, the cognitive skills. But how do they teach the cognitive skills in this lunatic way that produces intellectual crippling. 
Then they have the affective domain, and that's that area of the curriculum that's devoted to feelings, emotions, behavior, activities, values. All in the affective domain. And that's where you get the values clarification and the situational ethics and the uh, multiculturalism and the globalism and the death education and the sex education and the evolution and the social studies and all of that uh, uh, nonsense. That is now the predominant and most important part of public education today. The educators are willing to sacrifice everything in order to maintain that affective domain. And that's why parents don't know what's going on. They don't realize that the affective domain now is the most important part of the public school curriculum. Because they want to influence the child's feelings and values. They want to produce a bunch of uh, atheists and humanists. And incidentally, you know what they do with the so-called gifted? Gifted and talented, they have these separate programs for them. Why? Well, they're culling out from the student population those youngsters who are going to be the leaders of tomorrow. And they want to make sure that they are the humanist leaders of tomorrow. And so they take them to the United Nations and they take them to, uh, uh, they groom them into believing in this one world federalist system, into socialism. And that's why so many of these kids you know, you can't talk to them. They're very bright, they're very intelligent, but they're being groomed to be the leaders in this pagan, new pagan society that they're creating. And that's why they single them out. The rest of the population is going to be dumbed down to the point where they can be led by, by the nose. And that's why they teach children to read the way they do. The results, of course, are not exactly what they expected, are they? They couldn't possibly be because you cannot, you cannot get good fruit from a rotten tree. And the premises of public education today are, are so evil, they're based on lies, based on falsehood, uh, that you couldn't possibly get anything good from it. And that's why I encourage the homeschool movement as I do, because I consider the, the homeschool movement to be the salvation of this country. That there have got to be enough parents who are going to save their kids from this horrendous education system that is literally destroying millions of American children. You know, it, it really breaks my heart every September when I see parents putting their children in public schools, these cute little tots with their smiling faces, and they're so eager and they put them in this public school and in a year's time they're totally changed. I mean to my mind that, that what a crime is committed in this country every September when that happens. And then what, what can one do about it? I believe the homeschool movement represents the only real grassroots uh, rebellion against this horrible ungodly evil that is now uh, you know has, has become the public education system of America. And you can't change it. You now people say, well, can't we reform it? Well, look, we've been trying to get phonics in the school since 1963. What, what success have we had? Sure, there were times when we got a school system to, to adopt phonics, and it lasted for two or three years, but then as soon as the parents, you know, uh, lost interest, the educators went right back to their to their uh, uh, curriculum, their agenda. This agenda was created early in this century by the progressives. Now, who were the progressives? Well, they were a new breed of educator that came on the scene in the early part of this century. And what distinguished them from their uh, previous colleagues was that these men no longer believed in the religion of their fathers. They were members of the Protestant academic elite who no longer believed in, in God or Jesus or the Bible. They now put their faith in science, evolution, and psychology. Science to them explained the uh, 
of the workings of the mechanical world. Evolution explained the origin of man. Man was just an animal. He arose out of the primordial ooze with the rest of the creatures. And, of course, psychology now gave, gave the educators or, or the scientists a, a scientific means of studying the human mind, human nature. And in addition, it gave them the scientific means of controlling human behavior. Now, these men were also socialists. Now, why were they socialists? I mean, you could be an atheist without being a socialist. Ayn Rand was an atheist, but she certainly wasn't a socialist. But these men were socialists. Now, why were they socialists? Well, you see, when you reject God, when you reject the Bible, you have to deal with the problem of evil. And, and uh, they had to come up with an alternative, an alternative explanation. How does the Bible explain the origin of evil? Evil, according to the Bible, man fell in the Garden of Eden, came under the influence of Satan, was infected with this, with, with this satanic spirit, and has passed it on to generations after that. In other words, the evil that men do is a result of man's basic sinful Depraved nature. John Calvin called it innate depravity. Catholics call it uh, original sin. And of course, the uh, the uh, the religious uh, the Calvinism and Catholicism uh, say yes, man. True, you're born with original sin or, or innate depravity, but you can still lead a happy productive and long life provided you live according to the precepts of the Bible. If you live according to God's law, you can lead a very happy, wonderful life. Otherwise, you're going to be destroyed by your own sinful nature. Well, now, if you believe that all of that is fairy tale, if you believe that the Bible is just legend and myth, then you've got to come up with your own explanation. Where does evil come from? Where do, why do men do the horrible things they do? Why do they commit murder? Why do they commit mayhem? Well, the progressives said, well, we know the reason. It has nothing to do with an innate sinful nature. They said the reason is obvious. Evil is caused by ignorance, poverty, and social injustice. You see. And what causes social injustice? Why, it's this horrible... Economic system of ours called capitalism, that causes social injustice. Individualism causes social injustice, people only thinking of themselves. And of course, religion causes evil, because if you go around telling people that they're sinful by nature, well, you know the power of suggestion. They're going to go around acting sinfully. So they said, if we want to get rid of evil, We've got to get rid of capitalism, individualism, and religion. And we've got to replace them with socialism, collectivism, and atheism or humanism. That's what we have to do. Now, these men then embarked on a messianic mission to change America from a capitalist, individualistic, believing nation into a socialist, collectivist, and atheist nation. Now, remember, these, these plans were, were uh, put into motion before the Russian Revolution. As a matter of fact, John Dewey, who was the leader of all of these people, the philosophical leader, he didn't get his inspiration from Karl Marx. He got his inspiration from an American by the name of Edward Bellamy, who wrote a book entitled uh, Looking Backward, published in 1888. And in that book, Bellamy projected the fantasy of a socialist America in the year 2000. So if you want to know what plan, what, 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 what model they had in their minds for a socialist America, read Bellamy's book. It's all there. That was the blueprint. Looking backward. Edward Bellamy, who happened to be a Unitarian, incidentally. And so they embarked on this messianic mission to change America. Now, why did they embark on this messianic mission? Well, you see, all of these men came from good Christian families. John Dewey had taught Sunday school as a young man. Others had parents who were ministers, missionaries. They knew their Bible very well. They knew their Christianity very well, and they were determined to prove that the Bible was wrong and that they were right. Why? 
Because if they were wrong and the Bible was right, where do you think they'd be going? That way, right. So they had to prove that they were right. Now, how could they prove that they were right? Well, they said, if we bring about socialism, we will prove that human nature is basically good. That people are wonderful. That if you remove the societal causes of evil, we will prove that evil is caused by society, by all of these things. And we will have proven once and for all that the Bible is myth and legend and is wrong and that we are right. Now, John Dewey, uh, they said, oh, now how are we going to do this? How are we going to change America? Well, they knew that American adults were not about to give up their private property, their religions, and uh, their individualism. So how are they going to do this? They said, well, we have to work on the children. We have to create a new education system that will train children in such a way that they will get rid of capitalism, they will get rid of individualism, and they will get rid of religion. Well, that required a new curriculum. So John Dewey got to work in his laboratory school at the University of Chicago, and he labored for six years coming up with a new curriculum for the schools of America. And he wrote a little book in which he described it all called School and Society. That book is required reading in every teacher's college. Now, what did John Dewey propose in that book? He said, well, what we've got to do We've got to downgrade the emphasis on the intellectual, the academic, and the literacy skills. We've got to downgrade that, and we've got to put the emphasis on the, uh, on the, on the teaching of the social skills, socialization, behavior, values, emotions, sexuality. That's where we must put the emphasis if we want to create little socialists. We've got to downplay literacy. Now, why did he feel that he had to downplay literacy? Well, he said, the culprit behind the individualistic religious system is high literacy. Why? Well, high literacy produces these individuals with this independent intelligence who are not interested in the, in the collective. They can think for themselves. They can curl up in a corner with a book and read and enjoy themselves. They don't need others. He said, we've got to get rid of that. That is antisocial. We've got to lower the level of literacy. We've got to produce a kind of utilitarian literacy where children will be more dependent on their peers. And so what are the schools doing today? They have cooperative learning. Have you heard of that now? Where kids sit around the table and it's, it's not considered cheating. But the smart ones help, uh, help the, 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 the not-so-smart ones. They work together. They learn to read together. They think together. Now, you and I know that your mind is the, only, is the one precious thing of your own that nobody else can penetrate. It does not lend itself to collective learning. And yet this is what's now being drilled into the, children, in the schools of America. So John Dewey said, we've got to change the curriculum. He worked, he created the new curriculum, and for the next 20 years the educators labored to, to put these things in the schools. Now how are they going to dumb down the American people? How are they going to reduce the, the literacy level of the American people? Well, what they did was they dug up a method of teaching that had been used in the, ninth, in the 18... 30s and 40s, a look-say method, a whole word method that was invented by Thomas H. Gallaudet, the teacher of the deaf and dumb. He wrote the first look-say whole word primer in the United States. He figured that the deaf learn without hearing sounds. He said that the way the deaf, you teach the deaf to read is you have a picture and a word, juxtaposed. So the deaf learn by sight. And he figured, well, why can't normal kids learn that way? Well, they put that method in the Boston schools in the 18, late 1830s and early 1840s, and it produced such failure, such horror, that the educators got rid of it. Those days you could get rid of something that wasn't any good because they didn't have teachers' colleges. <laughs> they didn't have professors of education. 
So they were able to get rid of it overnight. They just said, this, this doesn't work. They threw it out. So, but today, but the progressives took that method and then they added to it the findings that they had uh, uh, made in their research on, in laboratories with animals, how animals learn. Uh, as you know, uh, Edward L. Thorndike, who was the leader at Columbia University in creating these new reading programs, he had done all of his research with chickens, teaching chickens. <laughs> and he assumed that little children learn the way chickens learn. Uh, Ivan Pavlov in Russia did his experiments with dogs. You've all heard of the Pavlov dog. And he, he created the, uh, he, he developed the most uh, ingenious means of, of conditioning through these experiments with dogs. And of course, uh, then uh, James B. Watson, who was considered the father of behaviorism, he did his experiments with rats. And of course, B.F. Skinner, his disciple, continued to experiment with, with rats. Now, B.F. Skinner believes that there's not much of a difference between human beings and rats. Now, there may not be much of a difference between B.F. Skinner and a rat. <laughs> But I believe that there's considerable difference between human beings and rats. Nevertheless, these men, you know, uh, created reading programs based on conditioning techniques, on Pavlovian conditioning techniques. And they got that, and they joined that with Gallaudet's methodology, and they came up with Dick and Jane, and Tom and Betty, and a whole other, uh, you know, slew of other, uh, uh, clones of this type. And all of these methods of teaching use that kind of conditioning, conditioned learning. They don't use the mind. They repeat the same word over and over and over again. You know, look, look, see, see, oh, oh, go, go. They drive the kids crazy. And the kids know it doesn't work. The kids know it doesn't work. I mean, they know that the that this stuff is stupid. You knew it was stupid when you were being taught it, didn't you? When you were being taught Dick and Jane, didn't you say this is pretty stupid stuff? But your mother sent you to school and told you to listen to the teacher, so you said, well, there must be something in this. I mean, or otherwise my mother would not be sending me here, you know. And so you endured it. And if you had problems with it, you assumed that there was something wrong with you, not the school, not the teachers was wrong with you. Everybody assumed there was something wrong with you. Mother assumed that there was something wrong with you. Because mother said, are you listening to the teacher? And you said, I am, I am. You know. And the more you listen, the worse things got. Because the method doesn't work. We are not rats. We are not chickens. You see. We don't learn that way. But that method obviously was made to reduce the literacy level of the American people because by now they certainly know what's happening. And if they could come up with whole language at this stage of the game, something very strange is happening. Something very strange. So that's the reason why you ought not to put your children in public schools because of the four risks. The academic risk, forget about it. They're not going to learn anything. They can't even learn geography or history. You know that. I mean, I, I, I had to test the youngster, the uh, a high schooler, an 11th grader recently, and uh, I just wanted to find out if he had any general knowledge of things, and I asked him, like, uh, the capitals of certain countries, I, the capital of Israel he thought was Beirut, you know. <laughs> I mean, these, these kids, you say, well, they watch television. They don't watch Ted Koppel. They don't watch the new, uh, you know, McNeil Lara. They watch the Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> you know, some not, you know, that's what they're watching. So television is not teaching them anything. Television doesn't expand their vocabularies. So we're producing youngsters with so little. I mean, there's nothing up here. First of all, they can't use their minds. We are producing these airheads. Have you heard of the airhead? The American airhead? The all-American airhead? There's nothing up there. It's empty. It's air. 
And these educators have been pumping very hard. They're going to pump that air in, get that air, get the air in and the brains out, you know. So forget about the academics. The spiritual, from the spiritual point of view, they've devastated millions of children. They've turned them into lunatics, Satanists. I mean, you have to look at the get-ups that they wear. I mean, the clothes, the atmosphere. They've turned, they've turned youth into putrescence. They've made it putrid. You look at these kids, they're putrid. That's what they are. Dirty, putrid. That's what they've done to American youth. That's their paganism. And these kids are ready for anything. Rebellious. Oh, that's, well, it's normal for children to rebel against their parents. Since when is it normal? It is not normal. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, it's considered so abnormal that you know what they do to rebellious kids in the Bible? Stone them, right. You'd have to stone virtually 90% of the kids in America. The schools deliberately create rebellion. They want the kids to think that their parents are stupid and don't know anything and can't teach, you know, and are old-fashioned. But you see, the true purpose of education is for the older generation to pass on to the newer generation the knowledge, the wisdom, and the values of their parents' generation. I mean, that's what education is all about. That's why, that's why you send your kids to school, because you want to pass on to them your knowledge, your wisdom, and your values. And what the schools are doing, they're not passing on knowledge. They've destroyed any semblance of wisdom. There is no wisdom there. And values, they've turned everything upside down. So the schools are not even doing what they were supposed to do. In no way. The schools are destroying the public schools are destroying America. In fact, the latest reform is now called restructuring. Have you heard that word used? They are going to restructure the schools? Well, the purpose of restructuring is to destroy every last vestige of traditional education that exists in this country. To destroy education without destroying the schools. In other words, the teachers want their jobs, the establishment wants the money, they want to create the pretense of teaching, they're not going to deliver the goods, and they're going to so confuse the American people that the American people will continue to give because what does Mary Futrell, the head of the NEA, the former head, keep telling the American people? You're not giving us enough money. If you would only give us enough money, you would get ex educational excellence. But that's a lie. They have no intention of producing excellence. You can give them all the money that exists in the world. You're not going to get excellence from these people. Why? Because they don't want to give it to you. And you cannot get them to do what you want them to do. There's no way that you can do that. There's no possible reform. So the only solution is to get the kids out. Now, I'd like to devote the rest of this program to questions from you and a discussion from the floor.